of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The Ahinsa Lecture Series is just one of our programs, which was established in 2016 as part of the MGIP's Distinguished Lecture Series, inviting speakers from among the world's leading intellectual, uh, intellectuals and policymakers to spark transformative ideas for a shared future. Marking the International Day of Nonviolence and the kickstart of the Mahatma Gandhi's 150th birth anniversary celebrations, today MGIP has also launched a very exciting global youth campaign titled the International Campaign on Kindness for SDGs. We uh, launched the campaign today in India, Pakistan, South Africa, as well as Mexico. And I'll just show you some visuals, um, if we can see some visuals from the, from the launch today. Not this one. It's an, sorry, the kindness one. Just, just one minute, please. So we have the International Youth Campaign on Kindness for the Sustainable Development Goals, where we're aiming to spread a culture of kindness um, the next slide, please. We've had our launch in New Delhi in uh, India today, this morning. Next slide. In Cape Town in South Africa. And in Pakistan in Islamabad. So see, these are some of the visuals we have. Um, and of course, now we start with the Ahinsa lecture uh, uh, to commemorate the 150th birth anniversary celebrations. For the Ahinsa series this year, we're pleased to have very eminent speakers. Of course, um, we're all uh, familiar with Sadhguruji, and I'll introduce them a little later, uh, as well as Gregoire uh, Borst, who's a cognitive uh, neuroscientist. Um, I would now like to invite on stage um, the Deputy Director General of UNESCO to say a few words, please. Excellence, Vinay Mohan. Excellency, Mr. Ambassador and Permanent Delegate of India to UNESCO, dear Sadhguru, Professor Borst, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you at the headquarters of UNESCO for the third Ahinsa Conference. Today, we're celebrating the International Day of Nonviolence. It is thus natural for UNESCO, the main mission of which is to build peace in the minds of the people, men and women. It is thus natural for UNESCO to celebrate this day in its house, a house dedicated to culture, science, education, and communication. It is by maintaining knowledge, dialogue, the respect of diversity, and understanding of our common humanity that we are capable of facing violence and hatred. This year represents an important celebration as it marks the beginning of the celebration of the 150th anniversary of the birth of Mahatma Gandhi, a pioneer in the modern world of the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence. According to the Mahatma Gandhi, nonviolence is not a piece of cloth you wear or take off at whim. Its place is in the heart and must be part and parcel of our being. The concept of Ahinsa has deeply root, deep roots in the religious, uh, philosophical and religious traditions of India. It means that harming others is harming yourself. 
It remains a really relevant concept today. In our globalized world, in this interdependent world, facing fragmentation due to inequalities, we see an increase of the speech of hatred of others and intolerance of others. The distorted interpretations of culture, the ethical origin, the religion, the gender and ideology lead to discrimination and violent extremism. UNESCO considers that it's not only enough to fight against violent extremism, one must also stop its emergence, prevent its manifestations, and stop them before they develop. Our organization has, has been at the forefront of actions to prevent violent extremism through guidance tools and the training for educators, media literacy, youth empowerment, skill development, and the strengthening of the mechanisms to protect the cultural heritage under attack. By focusing on these areas of expertise, we are able to provide greater assistance to our member states to create sharper strategies to prevent violent extremism and to support the UN Secretary General's dedicated plan of action on this front. The Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development, UNESCO's research institute in Asia Pacific, is playing an innovative role here. For the past six years, it has been leading role, leading work on education for peace, sustainable development, and global citizenship. To cite just a few examples of the Institute's re recent activities on the prevention of violent extremism, last year, the Institute launched the first youth-led guide on preventing violent extremism titled Youth Waging Peace, which bring together, brings together the experiences of over 150 youth from around the world who work to tackle extremism. Just today, the Institute and its global partners launched a new campaign called the International Campaign on Kindness for the Sustainable Development Goals, an appropriate accolade, accolade to Mahatma Gandhi's doctrine and a campaign we can all get behind. One particularly in exciting project of the Institute is the development of a unique curricula on global citizenship entitled Libri that focuses on building emotional intelligence in children by inculcating competencies of empathy, compassion, mindfulness, and critical inquiry. This project links closely to the theme of today's Ahinsa lecture. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank, Ma, uh, to thank the Mahatma Gandhi Institute and the permanent delegation of India to UNESCO for this initiative. This year, we are delighted to welcome two eminent speakers who will discuss how peace can be calculated through neuroplasticity and education. They come from very distinct fields of science. Sadhguru is a renowned spiritual reformer and a bestseller author, deeply engaged in improving human well-being and our environment. And Grégoire Bauer is professor of developmental psychology and cognitive neurosciences of education at the Paris Descartes University. Neuroplasticity is a, at a very basic level is about uh, renewing the hard wiring of our brains by focusing on the social 
and emotional part of the brain, not just a thinking part, we can potentially increase empathy, inquiry, and compassion. This could have fascinating implications, not only for our education systems, but more broadly for addressing contemporary global challenges, including violent extremism. Together, our speakers will join on insights from spirituality and neurosciences. I am sure that you will join me in welcoming them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite on stage uh, the, uh, His Excellency, Ambassador of India to France, as well as the permanent representative of uh, UNESCO of India on stage, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, respected uh, Sadhguru, uh, Excellency Xingzhou, the DDG of, uh, of UNESCO, a director of uh, Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education and Sustainable Development, uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it gives me absolute pleasure to kick off the first of the events in this year which marks the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi through this third lecture, third Ahinsa series of lecture uh, on which we would have uh, privilege and honor to, to listen to the dialogue between Sadhguruji and, and, and Gregoire Post. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to UNESCO, to the Director General of UNESCO, and to the DDG. Uh, because of whose support and constant encouragement, the work of Category 1 Institute, which is Mahatma Gandhi Institute, has today reached a stage where it is a well-known, well-recognized international institute. Let me also thank uh, the, the, the director of the institute, uh, Mr. Dariyappa, for his, for his very strong leadership of the center and for giving us this third in the series of, uh, of, of lectures. Um, uh, the today's topic, of course, is creating a, a culture of peace, uh, old yet a very new topic, uh, old topic on which we'll probably have a very modern yet perhaps uh, always relevant take by Sadhguruji and by, by Gregor Faust. Uh, since we are celebrating 150th birth anniversary of Gandhi, perhaps it is, uh, it is pertinent to, to recall what he stood for. Uh, DDG mentioned at length uh, some aspects of Gandhian philosophy. At a very personal level, I don't think, I don't find myself adequate enough to speak anything about Mahatma Gandhi. I'll be very honest here. Uh, people with infinitely greater wisdom have spoken about Mahatma Gandhi, his legacy, and what it stood for. Uh, I would rather not try and dilute that with my to penny worth. But I would only share, since reference uh, was made uh, um, about the launching of the global campaign on kindness, about uh, uh, different aspects of Mahatma Gandhi's teachings, be that in the field of education, community development, peace, etc. I would only share uh, one very practical experience which I had a chance to connect with and on which 
Mahatma Gandhi had some connection. Um, I had the opportunity to serve at the Indian Consulate in Durban, South Africa. 24 kilometers from Durban, there is a settlement called Phoenix Settlement. It's today called Settlement. In 1904, when it was set up, it was called Phoenix Ashram. There were two ashrams set up by Mahatma Gandhi in South Africa. One was the Tolstoy farm up north in Johannesburg, which is now called Hautung. And the second was in Phoenix, in the province of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. If you wanted to see the act of kindness, if you wanted to see the act of community development, if you wanted to see a genuine effort made for peace at a time in a place which was absolutely conflict-ridden, Phoenix Settlement is the prime example of it. It's a settlement in which, to the best of my knowledge, Mahatma Gandhi started his first experiment, his first experiment of community development. Perhaps the initial steps of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi becoming Mahatma Gandhi, some steps, some, some steps in the journey went through that Phoenix settlement. I must have made countless number of trips from Durban to Phoenix in three years of my stay here. And you could, uh, even 100 years later, this was, in, this was in 1994 to 97, three years that I was there. Ashram was set up in 94. Even 90 years and now 100 years later, you could, uh, you know, you could visualize what, what, the chap, what the person was trying to do 100 years, much, much ahead of our times. Uh, and I think uh, that impression which, which, which I gathered over three years of my stay uh, actually uh, obviated any need for me to undertake any academic research on, on what Mahatma Gandhi stood for because I could easily visualize and relate to what he was trying to do in a community uh, of uh, Indians and Africans uh, in 1904 in Phoenix Settlement, which I thought in itself was, a, was, a, was, a, was an enormous act of uh, kindness, enormous act of community development leading to peace and development. Uh, with these words, uh, let me once again uh, welcome all of you here. Thank each one of you here for being here this evening and look forward to the uh, enlightening and wisdom filled words of Sadhguru and Gregoire Faust. Thank you very much. Thank you, His Excellency. Uh, we'd like to reveal some uh, stamps that have been uh, released by the government of India on the launch of, um, thank you, on the launch of the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhiji. I forgot I had to remain here for this one. Thank you. These were released earlier uh, this morning by, by Prime Minister of India, uh, Shri Narendra Modi uh, in Delhi. It's also a small video that we'd like to play on the occasion. Again. This, this yes. is the song of Mahatma Gandhi, which he used to love, Vaishnava Janato Tere Kahiye sung by, uh, by a, a very well-known, noted French artist. This one is actually a line art video uh, done on Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, it's about four minutes.
been waiting for. Uh, this year, uh, we are pleased to invite two very eminent speakers in their respective field. Uh, Sadhguru and Gregoire Burst will be engaging today in a dialogue moderated by MGIP's director on creating a culture of peace. May I please invite Dr. Ananta Duryappa, director MGIP, to come on stage. Uh, our speaker, Gregoire Burst, is the next person I'd like to invite on stage. Gregoire is a full professor of development psychology and cognitive neuroscience of education at the University of Paris Descartes. He investigates the role of cognitive control in neurocognitive development in various domains and school learning from childhood to adulthood by combining be behavioral, genetic, and neuroimaging approaches. He has published more than 60 scientific papers, five books, including one for kids to explain how their brain works. 
Gregoire. And lastly, but most importantly, Sadhguruji, we'd like to invite you on stage. Uh, Sadhguruji is a yogi, mystic, visionary, and best-selling author, and has been conferred the Padma Vibhushan by the Government of India in 2017, the highest civilian award of the year accorded for exceptional and distinguished service. Probing and passionate, insightful, logical, and unfailingly, uh, unfailingly witty, Sadhguruji's talks have earned him the reputation of a speaker and opinion maker of renown. He has been a primary speaker at the United Nations headquarters, a regular at the World Economic Forum, and a special invitee at the Hindustan Leadership Summit, Australian Leadership Retreat, as well as the Indian Eco e Economic Summit and TED. Sadhguruji has also been invited to speak at leading educational institutions, including Oxford, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Wharton, MIT, amongst others. So with further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Duryappa to now commence the dialogue. Thanks, Akriti. Uh, so I guess this is what everybody's been waiting for, uh, start of the dialogue. What I thought I would do is uh, give a couple of minutes for Sadhguru. He wanted to say something uh, about, uh, like I would fondly call him Bapu, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. He was an inspiration that I actually forced the third child to be born on October 2nd. And she's celebrating her birthday somewhere in Canada today as well. So I would like to pass this to Sadhguru to say a few words. And then I will kind of introduce the way we're going to uh, structure this discussion today. birth anniversary year, we remember him in many different ways, but the most important thing is that his efforts, his mission of finding peaceful ways to dissolve most contentious issues on the planet, this mission, this effort, needs to continue because the culture of peace that he dreamed of is not at a reality. While we have moved away from World War, the two world wars of twentieth century, 
but still there is no culture of peace as such. Most nations are still speaking the language of deterrence. So, it's my privilege today to be here at UNESCO, who has played a significant role in using its influence to bring a culture of peace through education because without transforming both the content and the mode of delivery of education on this planet, uh, there cannot be a culture of peace. Just absence of violence for short periods of time is not necessarily a culture of peace. It's wonderful that we are here today. It's my privilege and I thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you very much, Sadhguru, with those opening statements. Um, first of all, thank you for accepting our invitation. We have a very busy uh, schedule. Gregoire, thank you very much as well. I know you've been flying around the world and you've just landed uh, very recently, but I hope the jet lag doesn't make you talk, uh, say silly things. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure you don't. But let me start off with, uh, uh, as Sadhguru had just alluded in terms of the fact that we are at a time when there's so much of violence, there's, we've kind of forgotten of what we had gone through 50, 60 years ago. Uh, one of the things that, uh, I'm going to present it as dilemmas. So the first dilemma that I, I'm, I'm looking at is that we're talking about a culture of peace. UNESCO was established and his preambles in the sort of saying that war starts in the war in the minds of men and that's where peace has to be found. Uh, looking at the cell, I want to refer to a WHO 2012 report and it had some very sobering results. It says in many countries, 25% of young children, uh, and this is between 13 to 15, suffer some form of depression. Suicide rates are on the increase, and as the director, uh, the assistant director general had talked about, in the sense the deputy director general, pardon me, had talked about the rise in violent extremism. How do we even try to think about a culture of peace when most of us are having a war within ourselves? So <clears throat> how do we find that resolution within ourselves? So the, the notion of the self comes in. And I wanted to sort of throw this at Sadhguru and, and Gregoire, who's been working a lot on emotional intelligence, neuroplasticity, as the, as the title is called, in, t in terms of how training of the brain is what they're talking about contributes towards this first, what I call, initial necessary conditions before we even start talking about a culture of peace. Well, uh, <laughs> without uh, peaceful human beings, there is no pe peaceful society or a nation or the world. And above all, uh, when as individual human beings, we do not know how to keep our minds peaceful, we do not know how to be peaceful within ourselves. What are we talking about world peace? <laughs> because uh, what you see in the world is just a larger manifestation of what is happening in human minds. Well, depression becomes a concern because uh, it is medically diagnosed. But there are various other forms of violence which are happening within the mindscape of an individual human being. We do nothing about transforming individual human beings, but we have lot of slogans and movements on the street about world peace. Such a thing is not going to happen because unless we create peaceful human beings, there cannot be a peaceful world because minus the human beings, the world is just great as it is. <clears throat> so it's only we, it's only you and me which is a problem. So what can we do about it? My entire life's work is just this, individual transformation, because without individual transformation, there is no such thing as universal salvation, there's no such thing. Because world, society, nation, these are just words. The reality is just you and me, how are we within ourselves right now? So we can talk about peace to individual people, who are, but when they are pushed, when something that's dear to them is lost, or something is threatened, they will get into different modes. 
So the entire system of yoga is just this, to create a chemistry of peacefulness because human experience, whether it's peace or stress or anxiety or tranquility or agony or ecstasy, every human experience has a chemical basis to it. In a way, this is a chemical soup. Are you a great soup or a lousy soup? That's our only question. If we give uh, the same soup-making ingredients to all the people here, well, they will not all produce the same kind of soup. They will make uh, hundreds of varieties of soups with the same ingredients. That's all that's happened with us. Fundamentally, we are the same ingredients, but just see in how many ways we have become. So, is there any part of education which is addressing how to handle human faculties of memory, of present keenness of experience and imagination how it runs and above all human chemistry, how to handle these things. We are not doing anything for the individual human being, but from early age onwards they are just piling up information about how to deal with the world. Violence is not just war. The very way we're treating the planet is violence. The very way we're walking upon this planet is violent. Our lifestyles are violent. Now, if something has to change in the coming generations, first and foremost thing is large-scale effort to create peaceful human beings, individual human beings being peaceful within themselves by their own nature, not because of the ambience in which they are in. Everybody is peaceful when they're in a good ambience. When things go wrong, when things don't happen the way you want, to be peaceful. <laughs> this needs a chemistry of peacefulness. As there is a science and technology to create external well-being, there is a whole science and technology to cre create inner well-being. Unfortunately, our education systems have completely diverged from those things. We are just interested in getting our children into a factory-like situation where everybody is going through the same extruder and they're supposed to fall out in the same shape. But that is not how human beings are made. Well, the God is going to tell us how even the shape of the brain can change <laughs> mm. Well, we definitely all the same. I mean, the brain in each and every individual works a bit what of the same way. What if they don't have one? <laughs> Except if you don't have one. But most of the time we do have one, so I'm trying to say, generally speaking, we all have a brain. Uh, we have also have a, a, a brain in a body, which is, I think, critical. It's like, that's why we differ so much with artificial intelligence, is that we have a very strong connection between our brain and our body. I mean, our brain controls all the body, but the body also sends a lot of information within the brain. So that said, we also know that we're all different, like the brain is shaped differently in each and every people. So you can also understand why within a similar em environment you can have like different outcome of different human beings evolving in different type of environment. But going back to this idea of war within ourselves, I think more generally if we talk about peace and how basically we can foster a culture and peace in each and every individual, there is something very interesting if you look at development, so if you look at children, especially babies, so there is like this uh, experiment that is very interesting. If you take a six, six months old baby and you show him two puppets and one of the puppets is interacting with the other and in one case the puppet you're using is actually having altruistic behavior. So it helps the other puppet to open the box in order to find what is inside the box. And then you come in with a third puppet and then this puppet actually acts like selfish, like in a selfish way or in an aversive way toward the other, what you find is that six months old, they automatically choose and systematically choose the puppet that display altruistic behavior. So actually, if you come back to this whole idea of Rousseau versus Voltaire, this idea that whether we actually come to the world with an altruistic mind or whether it's the society that becomes, that let us be like altruistic, it's actually, Rousseau was right. It's like babies 
like they come to the world with an altruistic behavior. So then it means it's the way we develop or the society in which we develop that led us to develop kind of those behaviors, self image behavior that can lead then and afterward to the type of kind of behavior that leads to war, basically. So I think it's, it's also that we have to take into account. So the babies actually come to the world with a fantastic organ, like the brain, that can change all the way through childhood and adolescence, and that will matter very slowly. And we know that there are factors that will affect this brain development, but interestingly, we are basically altruistic. And you can even show that in adults, if you put the adults in a time-pressured situation, what they will display is cooperative behavior. Actually, we become self selfish when we have the time to think about our behavior. So I think we need to resolve also this issue is the type of education we give to the children like will promote either altruistic behavior or selfish behavior. But let's think of this idea that originally they are altruistic be like beings, basically. So I think you've given us hope. You're sort of saying that when babies come, they, they have this altruistic, uh, let's say the neuron, the empathy neuron that, uh, that neuroscientist V.C. Ramachandran had talked about. He, he calls it the Gandhi neurons. Um, now, but at the same time, and so I'm asking the question, is it the system? But then on the other hand, we are the system. <coughs> but we, can, we see that humans can be extremely kind and it goes according to that altruistic. But at the other end of the spectrum, we can be extremely cruel to a point it sometimes boggles the mind in the level of cruelty that we can exhibit. Is there a gene or is there a neuron somewhere lurking in, the, in that brain that if triggered cre creates that level of cruelty? Or is it an external factor of the system which is a collective of all of us, which at some point we can't control, and so then we become part of that. So these, these are the questions. Is there a neuron which also at the end of the spectrum which also is able to exhibit cruelty, or is it part of the system? Well, if, if it's just about the neural level, there is no neurons of cruelty <laughs> that we can like put that aside, that's, that's clear. Uh, the, the brain is like 80, six billion neurons, one million of billion of connection between neurons. It's way more complicated than the internet. So we just have like preliminary knowledge about the brain. So don't put too much, uh, like it's not a magic bullet. It's not because you know the brain that you will know what to do in the world to resolve uh, basically war or peace in the world. But I'm just saying that it's within the same brain that you can express cruelty and actually altruism. altruism. So it's it's, it's different networks, but we are in the two, and sometimes we express like our bad behavior, sometimes we express good behaviors, but that's within the same brain. So then you need to have those kind of controls, and you need to teach those controls, because actually we know that what is the most predictive of becoming like an adult that is actually happy and that actually succeed through life is whatever the, indi the indicator you use for that. I mean, then you, we can discuss about that. Is actually your self-control. Is how you can control yourself. <coughs> so not in a bad way. It's not like being like inhibited about anything. But it's generally speaking, your ability to control your bad behaviors or your bad habits or the habits you can you will create it through your and through your interaction with the environment. Let, let's keep in mind that okay, the brain is a biological. Uh, a tissue, but it's, it's fundamentally a tissue that evolves in a social environment. And it will be affected by the social environment in, you, in which you grow in, not necessarily the educational system, but also the whole environment you have around you that will change your brain and change the brain for the good or for the worse. Oh. See, uh, when we talk about uh, the indications in the brain or neuronal activity, we're still talking about a certain consequence, it is not the cause. When we say the cause, in the yogic way of looking at human intelligence, we see sixteen parts to human intelligence. The front end of it is the intellect. Right now, our entire 
idea of intelligence unfortunately has become purely intellectual. Intellect means, well, if I ask you whether you want a sharp intellect or a dull one, <laughs> everybody without exception will choose a sharp intelligence or intellect. Essentially, intellect is a cutting instrument, it's like a knife. The sharper it is, the better it is. Knife is good for a dissection, not for… not good for variety of other activities. Suppose you use a knife to stitch, obviously you will leave everything in tatters. Well, this is the human effort towards peace in the world. We are using our intellect to stitch everything together, you leave things in tatters. And who holds the knife determines what the knife does. On a daily basis, does a knife save more lives or take more lives? If you see, it is saving many more lives than it takes on a daily basis. But knife by itself is not a danger, it is just that what kind of hand holds it. So this dimension of intelligence, we call it as ahankara, which is actually identity. So there is a whole effort in the Indian way of doing things about establishing a universal identity. Before a child's… child starts his education process, because education is seen as an empowerment, before you empower a human being, first thing is to have a cosmic identity, aham brahmasmi it's called. You must have a cosmic identity, otherwise you should not be empowered with education. Now we have a national identity, we have a racial identity, we have ethnic identity, we have religious identities, caste, creed goes further down, boils down to family and then to individual human being. Now all the evil on the planet, all the violence on the planet, all the crime on the planet is essentially a consequence of limited identifications. I'm concerned about myself, not about you, because my identity with this one. Or maybe I'm concerned about two people, not about the third person because my identity is with this one. So in terms of community, in terms of nation, race, religion, we are identified. But before starting education process, always in the East, we established a cosmic identity because only then your intelligence will work towards integration, towards a universal consciousness. But right now, we are establishing strong sense of limited identities and we're expecting peace will happen. It cannot happen in the very nature of things because that is how our intelligence will function because essentially our intellect will protect the identity that we have taken. Whether it's of gender, race, religion, nationality, inevitably our intellect will work only towards protecting our identity. So there's another dimension of intelligence which is called as chitta. The next dimension of intelligence is called manas, which means a silo of memory. When we say a silo of memory, there is evolutionary memory, there is genetic memory, there is karmic memory, articulate and inarticulate forms of memory like this, eight forms of memory are there. Right now, who you are is just a consequence of that memory. The way you think, the way you feel, the way you recognize things, everything is a consequence of this memory. So it is not independent of this memory. Whichever way your memory is stored, that is the way you recognize. Who is your friend and who is a stranger to you is just a question of memory. Who is your parentage, what is your parentage and what is your not uh, this thing, what is your nationality, what is not, is essentially your memory. And uh, beyond this, there is an intelligence called chitta, which is an intelligence without an iota of memory. Why this is significant is, Memory gives us many capabilities, but memory is also my boundary. I remember you, this is my boundary. I don't remember him, that is out of my boundary. So whatever we call as memory is a certain kind of boundary. Though it enables us in many ways, it also sets a boundary for us. So there is a dimension of intelligence where there is no memory. If once you dip into this dimension of intelligence, then because there is no memory in this intelligence, there is an experience of universality, there is an experience of oneness in the… within yourself. Because of this, your ability to erase all borders, 
the boundaries of your individuality are erased. Only if this happens to large segments of people or at least people in… people who are in positions of power and responsibility on this planet, you will definitely create a culture of peace. As long as I am identified as my nationality, you as yours, it's just a question of time. When something, a dispute comes, we will fight. Thank you, Sadhguru. I was really hoping that you'll move towards Chitra because that's something that has always kind of puzzled me when I've read, uh, seen some of your YouTubes. Gregor, you, you published a paper with uh, Hude uh, on consciousness and stuff, and the Chitra, as you mentioned, was consciousness, but what is interesting is an intellect without memory, yes. and that… It cannot work. And that's <laughs> bugly, especially so… Uh, well, I mean, there is something interesting about that, it's just that, well, we definitely memories could be related to, to the type of automatisms that you create. So what you were uh, uh, reflecting to is that the type of memories we have about past events like will basically create some priors in the way we're going to behave on the next basically occurrence of seeing someone. And I think that's, that's also very important is if you want to be open to others, if you want to understand that others can have different point of view on the same matters, so what we call in psychology, theory of mind. So my, the ability I have to basically understand that you can have different mental state as, as me and that you, I can also appreciate that it's okay for you to have a different state of mind regarding a similar matter. That's something that develops through life. And what is interesting is that we also have a lot of automatisms in that matters. And automatisms is great. It allows us to be extremely, very well adapted to our environment, but from time to time, it led us to make systematic mistakes. So for instance, if we take something as simple as taking, taking the perspective of others, which is like fundamental, if you want to basically create an understanding of others, you need to be able to take their perspective, okay? Very simply put it, like it could be a visual spatial perspective. So knowing that like, you see this object differently from me. And that will, that actually entails, and that's what we've been shown, that we showed in our studies, that entails like basically to resist your, your egocentric biases. So I'm intrinsically looking at the world from my perspective. And what I need to do is like basically be able to resist to this egocentric bias in order to take the perspective of others. And so we've been like conducting studies in the lab lately in which we showed that basically Taking the perspective of others is costly, and it's even more costly when you have stereotypes, so memories of how the other behave. So that actually drives you to be even more egocentric. So we showed that this is the case for stereotypes related to gender. This is related to stereotypes related to ethnicity. This is related to stereotypes we have about just the in-group, out-group. So the mere fact that I'm thinking that you're not part of my in-group makes it more difficult for me to take your perspective. And that's like the basic, like one of the, the founding block of empathy. So empathy is rooted on my ability to take the perspective of others. But Sadhguru, I'm, coming I'm, back. I'm talking about memory in a much more basic way. In the sense, uh, suppose uh, we feed uh, Gregor with Indian food for three months, his complexion won't change because the body just remembers this is how it should be. Or uh, if I eat dog food for three months, uh, I won't become a dog. Uh, because my evolutionary memory one hundred percent remembers whatever you put into this, this has to become only this. So memory as you remember is just a small quantum of it, but the real memory is there in the body, not in the brain. Your body remembers more things than your brain can ever remember. Every cell in your body remembers how your forefathers were, or let's say ten generations ago, how your great-grandfather looked, you don't remember in your brain, but his nose is sitting on your face, so because the body remembers. So, memory I'm looking at in terms of… In fact, uh, from our parents we got only one cell each, obviously it carried the whole memory in those two cells and here we are. So, memory is not just of what happens in the brain, what happens in the body is much, much bigger. 
and uh, by stabilizing the body, that's what the yogic system is about, by stabilizing the body, the very shape of your brain and how your brain functions can be completely altered. I'll tell you a simple thing. We, about fifteen, sixteen years ago, we started a school inside the yoga center. And one morning I went there for the morning assembly, all uh, six, seven-year-old children, they're all sitting like this, like this, like this, like this. I said, what's happening to these children? Why are they like broken tops, you know? Why are they all unsteady like this? I just started uh, the seven notes of the music, twelve minutes a day. You won't believe after three months I went there, everybody's sitting like this, unmoving. Today, I can show you children who will sit like this, unmoving, for anywhere between five to six hours effortlessly. They won't move. And this will stabilize the neuronal activity in the brain in a fantastic way. Our whole effort is to create intensity without intent. People are always trying to change the brain, even uh, there was a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, the way you think is the way you become. With intent, you can change the brain or the shape of the brain or how it functions, definitely. But we are talking about a dimension, you create intensity without any intent. Life happens exuberantly, but no intention. This creates a completely different dimension. This will create an ambience for individual genius to unfold. In this, you will see always, wherever, whether it's a scientific genius or a musician or a sports person, the moment some genius within him unfolds, suddenly his identity is not limited to small things, always. This kind of comes to… it reminds me of uh, uh, a paragraph in uh, da Daniel Goldman's book on emotional intelligence where he talks about the intensity to a point where you get into a zone, the flow, that you're completely oblivious to er anything that's going around you. And it might extend for a couple of seconds, it kind of might extend for a couple of minutes or well, sometimes we live like hours. that. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> and even hours. So how, how, how does that, how does one, and I'm going to move that to the education, how does one get into that, into that flow, into that zone um, without using, as you're sort of saying, the brain? See, uh, what we call as education is for different purposes, for different people. For example, in India, India is not one nation, there are many layers of India. So you cannot apply the same thing for all of them. So we have three systems right now going with uh, the Isha educational programs. We have Isha Vidya, which is the rural education, where this is mainly from the age of six, they're starting on computers, English language, because this is designed to get them out of a social and economic pit which they are trapped in. In the rural India, in the remote parts of India, there is no opportunity for them. Unless they learn English language and know some technology, they cannot get out of that situation. So that is made like that. We have another school called Isha Home School which is run in a completely different atmosphere. This is for the more affluent. This is difficult to scale up. Here for every child or for every and on average, for every four and a half children, there is one adult taking care of them. They live in a household of twenty with a very committed couple who will be like their house parent and they take care of them. Everything education happens in the house except for sport, library and uh, activity outside. Everything else happens within the home. They grow up in a very intense education mode. They're following some system in the country, they're right now following the Cambridge system of education so that they're internationally compliant. We have another school called Isha Samskriti, where if a child comes to the school, they have to come with a commitment of twelve years, otherwise we don't take them. Because here there is no academics, they learn only classical music, classical dance, yoga, Kalari Paitu, which is the mother of all martial arts, Sanskrit language and English language. You must see these children, they are intense means super intense. Our effort is only to grow the human body and the brain to its fullest without any intention, without ever asking what will you become later on. But their level of focus and commitment 
and the way they have evolved, these children, is a phenomena to watch. So, I'm going to transition to my second dilemma. I want, I'm going to be a little bit provocative here. The present education system that we have, um, and you just alluded to three, some of them have some similarities with what we have here. Now, the thing that kind of, the dilemma here is that this present education system, we talked about a lot of kids who are having anxiety, depression. Now, if we do a really good job of strengthening this education system, and we assume that SDG 4, which is the, one of the global goals on education, is that assumption is that this education system is the one that would deliver, we might end up in a catastrophic situation where we have 100% literacy but with extremely high levels of depressed people running around <laughs> the world. Um, so my question is, do we do a fundamental change in the objective of education rather than the traditional economic model that now drives, like what you have alluded during our discussions earlier on, is it about building human capital or is it about human flourishing for the individual, which I think the third stream of school that you had talked about alludes to. How do, how do we tackle this? So with the kind of uh, population pressures we have, doing an ideal form of schooling is utopian. It's, it's not possible with the kind of population pressure we have. Millions and millions of children need to be educated. Doing an ideal system in countries like India will be out of question. We can only do this in small numbers. Scaling that up is not a possibility. First of all, if we have to change this, we have to change our economic module. What is significant in our life? This has to change. That's not going to change right away. <laughs> That's going to be too dreamy. See, when economics is the only value in a society, money is the only value, let me put it more bluntly. If you say there is a big man in this city, it doesn't mean he has a big brain or a big heart. No, he just has a big pocket. That's what it means today in the world. So when money is the only value, competition is inevitable. Where there is competition, of very intense kind, as the competition gets more and more aggressive, well, many will fall on the wayside, depressed, broken, in many, many damaged human beings we will create. And unfortunately, as you mentioned, that number is increasing to a point. See, in 2016, 18,600 children below 18 years of age committed suicide in India. Over 7,000 of them were below 15 years of age. 12, 13, 14 year olds, if they have to take their own life, I think we're doing something fundamentally wrong in our societies. There's simply no question about it. Well, if we talk about education at large, uh, I think, yeah, I think we're missing completely the point. It's, I agree with you when you say that well, if you ask a children, education is, and you let them fill in the rest, usually you say boring, which is not what you want for an educational system. Education should be about basically strengthening social emotional learning for once. Well, let's put it bluntly, where we know, even if we look at it from an like economics point of view, right, let's be taking the wrong side of the, uh, of the stick. Like, you know that 85% of the job now won't be there 30 years from now. If you continue to train the children the way we train them, <laughs> you're going to make them adapted to jobs that won't exist 30 years from now. So what you need to foster are abilities that are not fostered within the classroom. Being flexible, being attentive, being able to concentrate yourself on yourself, on your body. And I agree with you. I mean, I'm... It's, it's of course problematic from a neuroscientific point of view because I talk about the brain, but the brain is within a body. We know that we have neurons within the gut, that the neurons within the gut, if you change, for instance, there's like data showing that if you change the neurons within the gut from someone who has a, 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 a psychopathology, from you take the gut of the, the neurons, the, the microbiote of 
the neurons from one people that has no psychopathology. You put it in the people who has psychopathology, the people who got the psychopathology goes better. So of course there is this direct relationship between the body and uh, the brain. So I think this is what we need to foster within the educational system. Like, it should be fun. It should be, like, you, you need, like, basically the babies, they, they love to learn. And at some point they go at, in school and they don't like to learn. So we do the, the, the thing wrong. So we need to change, basically, the educational system. It should be fun for the children because if you know that if it's fun, you learn more, basically. So I think, like, what we teach is not the thing we should te be teaching. Well, let's put it bluntly, too. I mean, knowledge, it's accessible everywhere. Get this, uh, <laughs> like, laptop or whatever connected on the internet. The internet will always have more knowledge than you have at every given time. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't have knowledge, but that might not be the critical skills for the children 30 years from now. And we're always talking about what will be the word of our children, what will be the word we, left, we leave to our children. I think a good question will be also, what will be the children we leave for the, the word uh, 30 years from now? And I think that changed the perspective and what we want to do in the schools. So I think that, that's the critical point, that if you want to change the, the things for the children. See, uh, as uh, <laughs> Gregor, <laughs> as he said, uh, this whole exercise of heaping yourself up with information will be meaningless because the small gadget that you can carry in your pocket will say more things than your professors can speak ever. This happened to me when I was just thirteen years of age uh, and uh, I was largely allergic to school. So <laughs> one day somebody showed me a flatbed uh, calculator. For the first time I'm seeing a calculator, a uh, national Panasonic calculator, hundred rupees, very expensive those days. <laughs> so uh, they showed me tuk 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 tuk. It came out, what do you want? Any multiplication, division, immediately said, why the hell am I going to the math class? <laughs> because here it is, I can add, multiply, subtract, sine theta, cos theta, why the hell am I wasting my life sitting in the mathematics class? Here is everything. Well, at last that day is coming when children need not go to school. Schooling as we know it in the next ten to fifteen years' time, could become absolutely meaningless because uh, everything will be available knowledge-wise. The schools or the mystic traditions in India always focused on enhancing and enlarging human faculty rather than enhancing knowledge. That your ability to perceive has to be enhanced. Recently, because I have been running this Youth and Truth campaign, meeting all university students for the last one month, they've been asking me, Sadhguru, you're answering every question we ask, how is this? You have an answer for everything? I said, I don't have an answer for anything. I don't have an answer in my head for anything, but I just have clarity. I've worked for my clarity all my life to bring my faculties to that level of clarity that there is no mistake about what I see, that you see things just the way they are. I think this will be of immense value in future because information or gathering of information becomes meaningless. There was a time when large populations were… Uh, you know, I have seen this in the villages of India, when most of the population do not know how to read, they're illiterate. One guy, some letter comes and he reads. People, you should see the wonder. Actually, he's looking at the paper and saying all these things. It's truly fantastic, people sit there open mouth, gaping at him because just looking at a paper, he's saying all this. So that time is gone. Now a simple gadget will know more than the entire university knows. So this time has come, now is a fantastic time. This is a time for human beings to truly unravel and explore their consciousness because the burden of carrying information, assimilating it and expressing it in the world is gone. Some people are protesting, people are inviting me to this artificial intelligence conferences. I didn't understand why do they want me in artificial intelligence con this thing, I'm not a technology person. I said, why are you guys inviting me? 
They said, Sadhguru, we, we don't know what to do, our jobs will be gone. I said, that means it's a holiday. Unless you know how to enjoy your vacation, you're going to be in big trouble. <laughs> Unless you know how to be productive in a relaxed way. Unless you know how to be productive in your vacation time, because your life will be a vacation. This is the same problem the workers' unions of this world had in early twentieth century and mid twentieth century. When mechanization came, when assembly lines came, everybody protested our jobs are going to go. Now intellectuals are protesting, our jobs are going to go, they are going to go, there is no stopping. And isn't it great you will not have a job to do and you can pursue your life? Instead of trying to make a living, you can make a life out of this. That's most wonderful time <laughs> So on that philosophical note, and I was just going to say when you were it's saying… It's very practical <laughs> And practical. So we got a philosophical which is practical, which is always uh, oxymoron, but here we have it. What I'm really, in a, in a sense, when you said the Ishafa, the way that you mentioned one of the streams of uh, education, but it was difficult to scale up. And in fact, you just provided a solution in a sense that AI would take away a lot of the mundane jobs that we're doing, that we can actually now concentrate yes. on our children and provide the kind of nourishment that they will require as they grow up. A human child is not uh, like other creatures. When they are born, instinctively they know what to do, what not to do and how to survive because all they have to learn in their life is how to procure food, how to reproduce and how to gracefully die one day. That's all they need to learn, every other creature. And all this is instinctively built into them. There's… the learning part of their life is very small. It's not that there's no learning, but the learning part is actually very small and even that, without anybody's guidance, they're capable of learning that. But a human child is not made like that, simply because the range of development that happens in a human being is so vast and it can be much bigger than what it is right now, if only these concerns of survival are taken away from the human being. How to earn my living? Where to get my food? If this concern is taken away, believe me, human genius will unfold in a way that you have not imagined possible. So, as you said, definitely all these people who lose their jobs, they can focus on the children and above all, see you don't have to know physics to be a physics teacher. It is on a platform where everything, the best physics teacher is teaching physics, all you need is a loving human being who is inspiring for the children to be with. This is something I've always noticed. If you ask children why they took to a certain subject, most of them will say, because I like the teacher in my third standard who taught me math, that's why I took to math. Somebody says in fifth standard, I like my English teacher, that's why. The teacher that they loved, naturally the subject also they loved. This is how a child is made. This is the nature of a human being because unfortunately we have relegated emotion to a second place, but largely human beings are far more emotional than they are intellectual. Because we thought intellect is sense, emotion is senselessness, somebody interpreted it like this, we've lost it. But I'm asking you, the deepest and the most profound form of education, I mean emotion that a human being can have is devotion. Tell me, people think devotion means it's about God going to temple or somewhere, no. Tell me as any individual reached a state of excellence in anything they are doing, whether it's music or art or politics or business or sport or even spirituality, without being devoted to what they are doing, without being absolutely devoted to what you're doing right now, you never get to any big place, you do mediocre things. So, devotion or emotion has always been the forefront of human life, but unfortunately we've relegated that to a second place, thinking logical data process is more important, this is all we're doing with our intellect. And that will become meaningless and I'm just looking forward, I hope it doesn't take too much time, when I'm still around it happens. Some last yeah, I, like we can. I I 
generally agree. Like it's it's important also to understand that there is no real dissociation between l reasoning and emotion. Actually, the two are very very strongly connected. So your brain works basically by the way you make years. Years like unfold in making emotion in, in our body, in our in our brain, and this recalling of the emotion that you basically made during like previous time helps you to correct your ears, whatever they are in whatever subject. So basically, interestingly, we are emotional being. We drive, the learning is drived actually by emotion, by simple emotion, by also very complex emotion, such as regret, relief. Those are actually very strong emotion to basically learn. And so it's, there is no opposition basically between the two. I also agree that basically the, the, the classroom in the 21th century well, not about like providing the knowledge, but will be probably to tailor the knowledge or tailor the, the abilities of each child depending on his learning uh, 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 curve. And that's what we need to achieve. We won't be able, able to achieve it with teach, like classes with 35 children. So maybe technology is a good way to help us like on this path to make the education a little boy, more tailored to each and every individual because we know that the more closely you're following the learning curve of the children, the better they develop. That's how, what works best, basically. And they also, it works best if you have a social environment, as you say it, like fostering a very strong socio-emotional environment around the children, not only at school, but also in the society, is a very, very strong leverage for their learning. Whatever the learning, even like the knowledge learning is improved by the social-emotional environment in which the children will develop. So I think, that's critical. We know it has an effect on the neuroplastic processes. So social, the, more, the, the higher the social-emotional uh, environment, the better it is, the higher the neuroplasticity, so the higher the possibility of learning. So I think, let's not think necessarily that it's dissociated. One will help the other. So if we like, put the emotion at the center, we will help everything, basically. Today is uh, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, anniversary. So, Mahatma insisted the means or how you do something is as important as the goal or what you're trying to achieve. This is why this whole non-violent way of doing things. So, how people become peaceful, how people become joyful, it's a big question mark. With a drink or a drug, a whole lot of people are peaceful or joyful. Is that the way to take the world? or it happened like this, there was a young woman who was married and the husband is abusive, verbally abusive, sometimes get physically abusive, sometimes get sexually abusive, but she was very peaceful. One day the husband looked at her after a burst of abuse, he said, how do you do this? I abuse you in so many ways, but you're always peaceful. She said, I clean the toilet. He said, what? Even when I beat you, you're peaceful. What do you do? She said, I clean the toilet. How does cleaning the toilet help you to be peaceful? She said, I use your toothbrush <laughs> <laughs> well, There are different ways, but <laughs> doing it the right way is very important. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, uh, I'm going to open up the uh, Q&A. Uh, there are two mics on, on either side. We are uh, running in time, so please, uh, if you can come to the, to the mic. Uh, I'm sure there must be questions. You must come to the microphone. To the mi there are two on the, on, on, in the... No, microphones will not come to you. You must come to the mic. <laughs> All right. Please go ahead. <laughs> no, normally they're used to So, I w I'm going to be biased and the young man with the beard because we have this identity together. So, I'll, <laughs> I'll allow you to go uh, ahead. You're trying to. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> hey, namaste. Um, so, we, we know that um, everything that occurs in this world is perfectly balanced and there's this notion of yin and yang and 
If you can come a little closer. To closer, yeah, of course. So yeah, there's um, a perfect balance in this world. So we know there's like perfection and there's not really something that we, we have to do. But when I look at the people around me or uh, some members of the family, I can see a lot of suffering sometimes. And um, that brings me in a place of discomfort. So like I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about knowing that everything is perfect, but at the same time, when I see the world outside of me, I, um, I feel that it's not as perfect as I want it to be. So how do I understand and deal better with this confusion? First, I, <laughs> I thought you wanted some brain reshaping. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, see, all human experience, don't give it all kinds of meanings, all human experience, joy or misery, peace or turmoil, agony or ecstasy, only happens from within you. Is that so? Yes. Hello? Yes. Is that so? You may think it's being stimulated from outside. No, people are doing what they know best. It's you who is going into these states. So essentially, what's coming from within you, at least what's come from within you, must happen the way you want it, isn't it? Yes. The world, the world will never happen hundred percent your way, never ever, believe me. <laughs> I've been around long enough <laughs> Even if you're just two people in the family, it won't happen hundred percent your way. Fifty-one percent your way means you have a controlling stake. Hundred percent your way, nobody will be with you. But what's happening within me must happen my way. If what's happening within me is not happening my way, if somebody can decide whether I'll be happy or unhappy, somebody will decide whether I'm peaceful or not, this is the worst form of slavery. We are giving it all kinds of names. Misery, any kind of misery essentially means your intelligence has turned against you, that's all it is. Your own thought, your own emotion, your own intelligence has turned against you. If your intelligence were working for you, would you keep yourself blissful or miserable? Please, what's your choice I'm asking you? Hello? You must choose right now. <laughs> if you could decide what happens in your thought and emotion, would you keep yourself blissful or miserable? Blissful for sure. What you want for your neighbor may be debatable. What you want for yourself is hundred percent clear, isn't it? So this is all it is. There are no complex reasons. You have not taken charge of your faculties. Your thought, we gave you a, a most complex computer, but you did not read the user's manual. That's all the problem is. This may look a little blunt and not so humane, but this is the way it is. If you learn how to keep your body, how to keep your thought and emotion, you staying blissful is a natural consequence, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. I'll work on that then. Thank you. <laughs> Namaskar Sadhguru, Boswa Gregor. Uh, my question is on the third aspect of today's discussion, education. Uh, History is full of examples of individuals who have achieved success in their respective fields. And these individuals have really not had too much of formal education, or if they've had some formal education, they've dropped out of college early on and pursued uh, their ambitions. So to this background, could you elaborate as to what should one pursue? Uh, a formal education? Should one strive for assimilation of knowledge or, a, you know, a pursuit uh, for wisdom? Considering that the jobs of today are not going to be there mm. tomorrow and the knowledge economy that we're talking about doesn't seem to exist in the future. See, uh, I hear such things in conferences always, but I never hear parents talking to their children like this. Formal education is no good, drop out of the school. You never 
You never hear any parent saying that. Only in conferences and academic places people say these things, but to their own children they never say that. They always say, pursue the education, pursue the education. Because there are many realities, all of which we cannot change right away. There is an economic reality, there is a social structure. This is the way we decide uh, who is capable of what. How do you decide somebody who has not gone through any program that he is capable of this? He has to prove it himself. Will the society and the times in which he lives in, it's very important, the times in which we live in, will it allow that opportunity for that person or will he be just crushed on the street? So, formal education is just that passport. It doesn't empower you to do anything, it's a passport, it puts you in a right, right place. Whether you will make it or not from there on is up to you, but it gave you an entry, it opened doors for you. But if you don't have formal education, then you must be that kind who doesn't knock on the doors, who break down doors and goes inside and anyway makes things happen because uh, you are of a certain competence. But that is not the case with every child that is growing up. It is best that they go through formal education. But what is formal? What is formal education? The shape of that we must change. But if you make dramatic changes just like that, many things will collapse, many human beings will be crushed in that change. So it's very important this change is affected in a gradual and sensitive way that we must be constantly watching and according to the needs. When the times allow us, we must change. If you change when the times are not ready, a lot of suffering will be unleashed because of that. So it is not for… A, see, we should not take a stand, it's for or against. My father was joking with me, you… getting you to school was so difficult, now why are you starting these schools? <laughs> I said, at least I have created one or two schools where children love to be there, you know, they're… they love to be there. The other schools are little more educational, academic, but these two schools which we have created, children want to be there. Children are crying when they have to go back home, they're coming ten, fifteen days ahead of before the vacation closes because they want to set up the school. So I said, they love the school, so it's fine. But you didn't send me to your school where I could love the school. So I escaped the school in every possible way. Now the important thing is, it might have worked for me. For me, sitting on a tree and observing many things worked wonderfully for me. But everybody in my class had gone up the tree and sat down there upon the tree. Uh, probably they would have devolved into becoming monkeys. No, I'm not trying to depreciate them, I'm saying it wouldn't have worked for everybody. So formal education is a common prescription which is cruel upon many children. That is why we've been pitching with Indian government to reduce the academics. Now, about a month ago, central government, the federal government announced that only fifty percent of the time at school, if children are there for seven hours, only three and a half hours will be academics. Rest of the time it will be sport, art, music and variety of other skills, which is a very positive thing to say. They've announced the intent, but to provide the necessary equipment and training for the teachers to be able to handle that half the time without a pedag pedagogy is not going to be easy. It's going to be many years of work to create that opportunity. Thank you. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's just the objective of the formal education that we need to change, not necessarily the formal education nor the universal education. I think it's what we do when we are at school with the children, like whether, of course, there is everything you, you said, but like something, uh, let's take the, the French educational system. We start to talk about the brain to the children at age 13. What they train every day when they go at school is the body and the brain. They don't know nothing about the brain. The brain, if you talk about the brain to a children, if you tell them that the brain will change due to learning, it actually promotes implicit representation of intelligence that is actually malleable, that you can change, basically, intelligence for whatever it is. And it's actually a very strong leverage for learning. We know that for a long, long time, and we don't put that in place in the educational system. So I think it's just a matter of like fixing new basically objectives to the, 
educational system and putting a stronger focus on domain general basically processes that are, are emotional in part. Thank you. Uh, hello, um, my name is Noor. I'm Syrian. I live in Paris since many years. So I have two questions related uh, to the Syrian crisis, children of Syrian crisis who lived like many years, seven, eight, about six, seven years uh, in the direct violence come from uh, war in my country. Uh, 10 million people who were displaced inside, outside the country. So this many of children have not opportunity to go to school or to go to normal school, as you were mentioned. So my question is, what do you think, in your um, opinion, the suitable case, a suitable su solution for their case, and uh, related to the, their memory, how could we affect the memory or their memory um, to be uh, not carrying all that violence in their mind of their life. Thank you. This question is for... This question is addressed to whom? By okay. anyone who would like to answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the unfortunate situations like this, whether it's Syria or many other nations which have seen this in the last century, unfortunately. It keeps repeating itself and in these situations the most vulnerable are the children always. Well, about erasing their memory, it's not necessary to erase their memory. It's very important when terrible things happen to us, we must remember but we should not become resentful. If we don't remember, we keep repeating the same things. When World War II ended, well, all these organizations and setups came up because the millions of people who died in this part of the world at that time, everybody was determined never again a war should happen. That was the intent of United Nations, UNESCO and various other organizations which came up. But uh, since 1950, they tell me, please correct me if I'm wrong, they tell me there's not been a single day on the planet where there has not been some kind of organized battle going on in some part of the world. Not a single day's break, that's what they tell me. So whether they gave us a break or not, but we know continuously things have been happening. So everywhere children are being subject to these things and if they transform their experiences of brutality and fear into resentment and hatred for those that they believe caused these things, you will breed another generation of hatred and that generation to contain it from not indulging in violence is going to be very difficult. So it's very important that now that it looks like in Syria at least, it looks like uh, the conflict is going towards a kind of a closure. I think immediately educational institutions, government, uh, non-government organizations, United Nations, they must set up large-scale uh, schools to, if at all, if you can call them schools. Yes, schools, some way to engage the children beyond their experiences now that has happened in the last few years. This is not an easy task, but the international community need to get into this. And the most important thing is, every human being at a very early age needs to understand this one thing, that my body and my mind should take instructions from me and nobody else but me. If this one capability if we bring into a child, a child becoming peaceful, loving and joyful is a natural consequence. Right now somebody else decides what kind of emotions I have, what kind of thoughts I have. So if somebody else is going to decide 
then there is no control over this situation. We have just not focused on this dimension of the human being, that the first and foremost aspect of all educational systems should be a child learns how to use one's thought and emotion and physical body. Right now, we are encouraging compulsiveness in so many ways. Essentially, this is a movement from compulsive existence to a conscious existence. Even if you want to see that there are no future conflicts on the planet of this scale that we are seeing in the twenty-first century, twentieth century we thought we were done with it, but twenty-first century has been a continuous conflict from the day it started from year two thousand, uh, it has been on. If we don't want to see this kind of conflicts, the most important thing is human faculty should be in individual hands. Right now, it's in the hands of social leaders, national leaders, religious leaders. They can incite emotion and thought in a certain way. It's very, very important. Human faculties are always in individual hands and nobody else but you. Sadhguru. Uh, so, in fact, uh, it's been one year that I am living here and uh, before coming here, I was in India. You should do that. And uh, when I was in fact working in a company and I had a colleague of mine, so we were close friends and he used to always uh, keep reminding me of my habits like uh, when we used to have lunch, he used to always say to me that I don't know how to eat the way I used to sit, he used to keep bothering me about it, the way I used to stand, the way I used to think about the situations I was in. He used to always tell me I did not have clarity. And uh, s at some point in time, he spoke to me about you, and I was quite ignorant about a lot of things, and I was going on with uh, my own world in my mind. So... Uh, there was this one day, he wa we were together in office and I was just like, well, so what did you do yesterday? So he said that he was at a funeral and I said, okay, and uh, if I may ask you whose funeral you had been to, so he said it was his mother's funeral. And I was shocked to know the way he managed to deal with that situation and I think he has done some of your programs and... Uh, he, he really follows you a lot. So he spoke to me about a few things that he learned from you. He spoke to me about Runanu Bandha and some, I really did not understand you much. You can come of, to the question. Yeah, so uh, the thing is that uh, you, uh, you have been into the service of mankind, so has Mahatma Gandhi, and so is the friend I just spoke to you about. So. In a way, you have been transforming lives, and is it, uh, is it that one finds one's true self in the service of others? Oh, I, I'm not in any kind of service. <laughs> I'm just working for a very selfish reason, because I want to live in a, a joyful and wonderful world, so I'm just working for that. I'm just working for what I want and this is all every human being needs to do that why are you stingy on your selfishness? <laughs> why don't you be universally selfish? What do, you, what do you think is best for life? Why don't you wish that it happens to everybody? Let me tell you because you have brought this question up. This is about thirty-six years ago, I was sitting on a rock, on a small hill, doing absolutely nothing and suddenly every cell in my body burst out into an ecstatic state, uncontrollable. What I thought was ten, fifteen minutes for about four and a half hours, tears of ecstasy flowing. Then I realized you don't have to do anything. If I don't mess with myself, if I simply sit here, I will burst into ecstasy. Then I tried with one or two people, I tried to make them sit and it happened to them also. Then I made a plan. At that time, the world's population was 5.6 billion people. I made a plan in two and a half years' time, I'm going to make the whole world ecstatic. <laughs> because you don't have to do anything. 
If you simply learn to simply sit here without messing with yourself, you will become ecstatic. But see, thirty-six years, huh? <laughs> Hello? See? Well, we've managed to touch uh, maybe four hundred, five hundred million people, but that's not my idea of the world. So I'm prepared for a life of failure. I know I will die without fulfilling my dream, but I'll die blissfully because how I am within myself is not determined by the success or failure of what I do. This is all that needs to happen to humanity, that you are expecting outside the whole world to work out the way you want it before you are peaceful and happy. It's never going to happen that way. The easiest thing to do is to make this human being, individual human being, peaceful and joyful. Then we work in the world. Depending on times, depending on how far people allow us, to that extent, see I want to… I want you to know many great beings have come on this planet. You mentioned Mahatma. Well, there have been Buddhas, there have been Jesuses, there have been Krishnas and Ramas and so many, many, many sages and many fantastic human beings. But when they came, if they spoke, hardly twenty-five people would hear because they didn't have a microphone. But today I can sit here and talk to the entire world. Never before this was possible. So this ability to communicate is for the first time in the history of humanity. So this is the time to change human consciousness. This is the time to change the very shape of what a human being is and what human society is because never before we could communicate like this. This is the very first time. But if we don't do it now, this time will pass and then it's very difficult. As a generation of people, we are the most empowered generation ever. It's my dream that we also become the most fantastic generation ever. The possibility is in our hands. But between a possibility and reality, there is a distance. Do we have the courage and commitment to walk the distance? That's all we're trying to do. You must walk, you're a young man, hmm? You must make sure that no matter what happens to your life, what happens to your life, what life throws at you, you cannot decide. What you make out of it is one hundred percent yours, yes? What you make out of it is one hundred percent yours. If this one thing you take charge, you have created a peaceful, joyful human being. This is the beginning of a peaceful and joyful world. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, this brings us to the end of this. I need to, uh, I will change the title from lecture to a dialogue. Um, I hope it was as productive to you as it was to me. I would like to thank Sadhguru for his time, his wisdom, and I think that was a perfect ending to the, uh, to the dialogue. I have a couple of things I wanted to provide. the shape of my brain. <laughs> so this is a gift that we give, uh, the Gandhi book. Uh, I found it extremely uh, illuminating to read. Sadhguru? Thank you. Thank you very much. Gregor, we didn't forget about you. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming yeah. and, uh, no and for your insights. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for you. Having. You. Uh, uh, I usually mess up at this time, but this time. But I you tried the glasses. You know. Sorry. You tried the glasses? Oh no, well, Mahatma Gandhi's glasses, you tried <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to thank a few people. I want to thank my colleague, uh, colleague Akriti, who did all the hard mm -hmm. work to make this happen. I, <laughs> I want to thank Sadhguru's group, the Isha Foundation. They did a fantastic job bringing in a lot of you, and we couldn't have done it without them. 
and thank you for that on behalf. And I want to thank my UNESCO headquarters colleagues who also worked very hard to make this a successful uh, dialogue. And, uh, and with that, I'm supposed to say that there's some stuff outside. Uh, <laughs> ah, so you need to pass the exhibition. You smell the food. It will. It ah, <laughs> that's the. <st> <laughs> Just use your senses, <laughs> and, it, and it will take you there. Uh, and I hope you enjoy that. It was the courtesy of the uh, Indian delegation to UNESCO. Um, and thank you very much for coming, to, uh, coming out tonight, and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Want a picture?